centres for you today, uh, who are going to do five minutes each. We've got a variety uh, of people. Um, we dug deep to, to find people that you may not have heard from before and just what their projects are and what they're doing. So thanks so much for coming. Uh, feel free to keep getting food during uh, the time we're here. But the people we're having today, it's going to be Jill first. Jill is uh, on the final stages of a PhD with us, has been a uh, principal, a teacher, uh, all sorts of things, and, and <laughs> lives walking distance from here, yep. if you didn't know. Um, so that's Jill. Then we've got Jenna, who works in our uh, education uh, faculty uh, and doing a great job there. We've got Clancy over the back there, who works... Uh, with Laurel's team, uh, but uh, is also doing a PhD at the moment. Uh, we've got Anthony uh, from uh, Theology, and then we're finishing with Richie. So uh, I won't introduce them anymore in between, but we'll make it seamless and uh, we'll go with you, Jill. Okay, okay thanks. All right, um, I, I've only got five minutes, so I'm just going to sort of jump in quickly, give you a, a brief um shot a snapshot of what I'm, I've been studying uh, into. Um, I'm particularly being interested in obviously faith development because I'm an educator and the core tenet of our business is to develop faith in our students that we teach. Uh, and so let's see how we can be more effective in, in that way. And so my questions were, uh, what are the characteristics of those teachers in Adventist Schools Australia campuses who effectively develop faith in their students. And I targeted 14 to 17 year olds uh, for various reasons. Uh, the second part of my question is what links exist between emotional intelligence traits and spiritual intelligence traits um, as these relate to the effective development of faith in those students? So I had um, have three groups that I uh, asked one question of and that was the question is what are the characteristics traits or capabilities that you observe in teachers known for their ability to develop Christian faith in the students they teach so the three groups that I asked that question of uh, one were the academics here at Avondale plus the um, the hierarchy of Adventist Schools Australia the education directors etc the second group was the principals of ASA schools and the third were the chaplains slash pastors who work within those schools. And I was tapping into their lived experience. So for that, they should be able to um, tell me, hopefully, um, what are those characteristics and traits. So uh, unfortunately, when I was gathering that data, it was uh, COVID. So I had wanted to have all of my data done and dusted by the end of 21. Uh, I didn't gather uh, my data until beginning of and into March of 2022. So out of um, the number of people that I asked, please contribute, I ended up with only 24 participants. Uh, however, out of that, um, I was able to get 181 pieces of data to analyze. So um, I wanted to share with you, and Maria sort of prodded me to, to do this, um, is to share with you how I was starting to collect my data. I wanted to use in vivo. I desperately wanted to because I love it. But um, the way that things worked out, uh, I, I thought, well, I better put all of what I've got uh, into um, a spreadsheet and it ended up being a workbook. So unfortunately you can't see around there, but um, I have I worked with Tony Williams, he's my other um, supervisor and Peter Kay, to look at all of this 181 pieces of data and to think about uh, for each of the different groups, what does that look like? And so we culled it uh, or put it into um, the themes, um, four different themes, and put it under the banner of um, effectiveness in faith development. And if you can see, I'm hovering over there, there the first um, theme was relationship to God. What, is, what did that the narrative say about the relationship to God? Uh, the second one was um, relationship to the students. And um, the third one was their personal attributes. And the last one was their uh, the outreach actions. 
And so um, I, I liked color. I liked the, the using um, color as a, a means for me to be able to look at this data. This was really helpful uh, when I was looking at it uh, in that I could see from a stretch, if, you, if I scroll through, um, you can see the points of um, the, the data points here uh, collated into this particular group. Group one was the um, ed directors and um, the faculty in the education department here at college, at uni, sorry. Uh, and I'll just look at that one in particular, but I could then see which one of the, the particular attributes that was striking for me. And so that's a first phase run through of, um, of what I caught. And then I also, so there's group two and group three. And then I also, um, in my literature review, I dug deep into emotional intelligence. Sorry, that's not good. Uh, emotional intelligence first, because I was really passionate about um, that aspect and student wellbeing, et cetera. And so um, I started looking at all of the data, that it, all of the journals um, that were available to me in that field. And then I started to see that, well, there's something else popping up here, and that was spiritual intelligence. And I wasn't, I wasn't even aware that um, there was such a thing as spiritual intelligence, like it's a bit logical, isn't it? But I wasn't aware of it as um, an educator. And so I pulled out um, the information from all of that um, that deep dive into emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence to see what traits there were that were rising up out of that that I can then see if that has an impact on uh, the data that I've collected from those three groups. And I've got one minute left. <laughs> so um, that I guess that's it in a nutshell. And um, I'm hoping to finish at the end of this year. So that's my target. I've just got to get my self into gear and start doing a bit more writing but I've thankfully I've got all of this information and my beloved endnote library which I don't know what I could do without I can go back into and I can pull out information from there so that's it <laughs> um just while Jen is coming up if anybody has any questions uh we'll take them all at the end Okay. okay. So hopefully our presenter will stay around if you're talking. Gotta set up technology. Thank you. Not yet, I'm sorry. Thanks, that's great. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jenna and I work in the School of Education and Science and I'm one of the education lecturers and particularly working with the secondary students. I wanted to share just a little bit about the areas that I'm interested in in terms of research and I wanted to talk to you just really briefly about my PhD thesis because it's informed what I'm currently researching at the moment, which is also moving into the space of education. Uh, as you can see there, uh, there are a range of different things that I have been researching and that I'm interested in. Uh, trauma theory and ecofeminism, uh, basically two aspects that have informed my PhD thesis. And I'll talk to you about that in a moment and how I combined these two frameworks as a, a lens for interpreting a, a body of literature. I'm also interested in ecology and sustainability, uh, Australian literature, contemporary women's writing, 
and also the Australian curriculum, particularly the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders cross-curriculum priority. When I did my PhD thesis, I was particularly interested in a, a writer for Jeanette Turner Hospital. She's an Australian-born author, and her work had been interpreted to a certain extent through the lens of trauma, and there was a little bit of work on ecology and ecofeminism, but not a lot. And as I started investigating her body of literature, I noticed that there was a really interesting connection between concerns with trauma in a variety of different ways and also how our connection to the natural environment and our connection to country is actually deeply related to different processes of working through trauma from a very individual perspective through to collective, cultural and also global. So Jeanette Turner Hospital was the focus of the thesis, but I also looked at other contemporary Australian women writers, including Alexis Wright, who is an Indigenous uh, writer, and also Lily Brett, who is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. So it was a really interesting um, and also very confronting uh, topic that I looked at. So this is just a summary of what I covered. Uh, as I said before, it was combining trauma theory and ecofeminism as a new interpretive paradigm for reading this author's body of work, Jeanette Turner Hospital. And that involved challenging and destabilizing dominant discourses about place and gender. Um, it also involved looking at a whole different range of sites and expressions of trauma as represented in the literature, embodied through country, the human form. And there was also a chapter where I looked at how art can be used to reimagine, conceptualize and work through trauma. This then led to a passion for understanding how trauma impacts Australian First Nations peoples in particular. There was also uh, a chapter where I looked at um, immigrant culture. And then towards the end, I had a close reading of one of this author's novels that focused on how we respond to situations that violate basic human rights and in particular terrorism. And what I discovered that was really interesting is that this author, Jeanette Turner Hospital, is one of the few Australian-born women writers who actually is confident enough to deal with terrorism as subject matter in her literature. So that actually makes her really distinct. And also what I noticed as I journeyed through particularly this aspect of trauma is that there tended to be a focus on personal trauma towards the beginning of her work, her earlier text. And then there was movement focusing on uh, Australian concerns with trauma, particularly our treatment of Australian First Nations peoples. And then there was movement more to global concerns with trauma. So it's a really interesting discovery in terms of the significance of her work. Last year, I took one part of my research in my PhD thesis and it eventuated um, as a publication. So this is what I'm really passionate about in terms of making a connection between how trauma is conceptualized and represented in literature, and then how some of these theories pertaining to trauma can actually play out in the classroom. So this article focused on two texts. One was written by Jeanette Turner Hospital, and she is a white Australian author. And then Alexis Wright is an Indigenous author. And so what I looked at here is Aboriginal conceptions of time and space across two different novels. So it was looking at a generative dialogue and how personal, cultural and ecological trauma is represented, particularly through privileged sites that are deeply connected to country. And what was interesting about this particular article is that it allowed me to position myself as a white Australian woman in a space that's really complicated when you're trying to understand and articulate expressions of trauma that are connected to Australian First Nations peoples. And that's also partly what I looked at in terms of Jeanette Turner Hospital's treatment of trauma compared to Alexis Wright's.
Now, the reason why I've shared a little bit about my PhD studies and my research in that context is because I'm now trying to see if there is a way that we can apply some of these theories underpinning trauma theory, particularly associated with working through trauma within a classroom context and the curriculum. So an article that I have worked on with uh, Dr. Adele Fall that is currently being reviewed for publication focuses on um, one of our cross-curriculum priorities, which is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and cultures one. And there are a lot of issues surrounding how this particular cross-curriculum priority is implemented. So what Adele and I have proposed is one approach to start effectively teaching this by looking at stage five, which is years nine and 10. And it's looking particularly at teaching a, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and cultures cross curriculum priority across English and history. So we're offering this lens of trauma theory, particularly focusing on working through trauma as a response to the fact that a lot of teachers and a lot of our teachers in training feel really uncomfortable sometimes and not particularly confident dealing with epistemologies and ontologies associated with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. So it's conceptual at this stage and we are recommending further research, for example, piloting this framework and looking at how it could actually work in a classroom situation. Also potentially how some of these theories can impact what we offer our undergraduate students here in university courses so that we are preparing them to feel more confident going out into the classroom and dealing with an area that I think is so necessary and we've still got a long way to go, but it's about raising awareness and giving our students some practical strategies to work with. So that's it, I'm out of time, but that's just an overview of what I've been working on. Thank you, Dana. It comes by to In my PhD project, I'm looking at the internet intertextual connections between a, a selection of biblical narratives and then communicating those connections through a performance work. So why performance? Because when narratives are performed together, they come into conversation with each other. And as hearers of this conversation, we find new perspectives on the text and perhaps new theological questions to ask. Now, one of the fundamental rules of my project is that the narratives that I'm looking at are not just contributions to the stories of the patriarchs and the prophets. That is, these women are not supporting cast members to the drama of the men of God. Rather, these women are the main characters of their own stories, whose narratives have more to say than merely background detail. The narratives in this collection all feature grieving mother figures whose grief is heard by God and whose dead or dying son is returned to them alive. The first speaker in this conversation is Hagar, whose story connects across to the narratives of Jochebed, Naomi, the widow of Zarephath, the woman of Shunem, and echoes across to the Marys at the resurrection of Jesus, particularly in the Gospel of John. But aside from this conversation with each other, there are side conversations that are going on in the scriptures. And these conversations are worth listening to. And the one that is most tension is the conversation between Hagar and Abraham's narratives in Gen Genesis 21 and 22, which I've decided to term the sacrifice of both of Abraham's sons. Now, I warn you, this is a new rabbit hole, which is why I'm wearing rabbits on my vest. I have no idea how deep this goes. This is uh, one little thought that I'm having, and I don't know how, how, how fruitful it will be, but let's see. So many scholars have pointed out that there are so many similarities between Genesis 21 and Genesis 22. Scott Nicato refers to Hagar in Genesis 21 as uh, becoming Abraham's true companion because her experience is so similar to his. She is the matriarch to his patriarch because she goes through a trial involving her son as he does. But I want to turn that comparison the other way around. And instead of privileging the story of the sacrifice of Isaac as the pinnacle of the main story, look instead to the story that occurs first. 
the sacrificial sending away of Ishmael by Abraham. And I want to suggest that the sacrifice of Isaac is not only a test of Abraham's faith, but it is also God's answer to Abraham's treatment of Hagar. Abraham sends Hagar and Ishmael away with insufficient supplies. These run out and are the direct reason that the two face death in the wilderness. In a Midrashic commentary on the story of Hagar, Arya Cohen says this, there is no other himat mayim or skin of water in the Bible. This scene embarrasses the rabbis. They ask, did not Abraham have great wealth? Could he not have given Hagar more than a paltry skin of water and a loaf of bread? Their embarrassment perhaps leads to their demonization of Hagar and Ishmael as sinners, as idolaters, who could not stay in the same household as he, and especially as Isaac. So briefly, the points of the two story that correlate are as follows. So early in the morning, Abraham gives Hagar and Ishmael bread and water, and he sends them away. They wander through the wilderness until the water runs out. Hagar places Ishmael under a bush to die and turns away from the site weeping. God hears their cries, and the angel of, the, of God calls from heaven, naming Hagar and promising her that her son will live and saying, I will make a great nation of him. Her eyes are opened and she sees a well of water. And then the next time God speaks, he commands Abraham to take his son and offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Early in the morning, Abraham takes supplies and he leaves his camp and they wander for some time to a distant place. Abraham binds his son and places him on the altar to die. The angel of the Lord calls from heaven, names Abraham and commands him not to harm the boy. Abraham looks up and sees a ram in a thicket, and then God promises, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven. Now think of these as performance texts. Notice how all of the actions that occur, all of the motions that Hagar goes through, are followed in the next, in the next chapter by the actions of Abraham. While there is a short story in the middle, the next time God speaks in the book of Genesis is after comforting Hagar is to command Abraham to take the child that he has not yet sacrificed to the wilderness and go through essentially the same journey he has sent Hagar on. This story always makes me oddly emotional at very awkward moments, like now. Ah, so God's answer to Abraham's miserliness to him sending Hagar on this journey that she expects to end in the death of her child is to make Abraham walk the same steps of anticipated death and grief. And that's my rabbit hole. Thanks, I didn't really realize what you're getting me to, uh, to do, Peter. I thought I was talking to some PhD students and not a lot of people who enjoy a free lunch, um, but that's all right. Anyway, I'll get my technology out. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, look, I've got a few research interests. I've got a few articles that are out there undergoing peer review, but I just, um, I was thinking of uh, students. Talk about another one. Usually you, you write an article and you try and find a place to publish it, which is a nightmare, particularly in theological circles. There's all these different areas, different ideologies between, between different journals, so you've got to navigate that. But uh, recently I had a, 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 the opposite where I was asked to write something, which is always nice, you know, if people come to you and ask you to write something. So I don't know if you've heard of the Encyclopedia of the Seven Day of Venice. Of Seven Day Venice. It's an online encyclopedia. It's a massive project. Um, they are basically going to try and put an entry on almost every Adventist imaginable, every event, every, it's, it's gigantic. Um, and it's peer reviewed and there's committee processes and this sort of thing. Um, and I, I think what they want is a resource um, on the internet, which people can go to because there's a lot of, obviously, uh, information out there, which is not good. And so it's to be a high quality uh, resource. Anyway, um, I'm just, you know, at my computer doing my work. And then I get this email asking them me to write an article. And I'm like, oh, okay. And um, I thought, why did they ask me? And it, not, it wasn't just any article. So you, you may or may not understand this, but it was actually to be on the investigative judgment, which is like one of the most controversial doctrines in Adventist history. And I'm like, oh, okay, you want me to write that? 
Oh, fair enough. <laughs> um, <End of> the <laughs> um, no, like Isaac, I've got to provide <laughs> and Ishmael. Um, now, um, first I thought, why are they asking me? Because, uh, yeah, I hadn't really published that much. But um, what happened is I went to a Bible conference and I presented a paper. Now, it was actually in Rome, so it was really good. Um, but I, I just, just wanted to, to talk about the importance of actually going out and presenting papers, um, going to conferences. You know, sometimes you just want to get into a journal, but there are some advantages because um, you get to meet other people, you get to network, people get to hear you or see what you do. And so obviously the paper I presented obviously went well enough that um, it was tangentially related to this topic. So they 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 asked me. And so I was like, okay, whew, um, this is a, a bit of a big ask. So they wanted 7,000 words at least. Um, I, I found I couldn't do it in, in less than 11,000. So I thought oh, hopefully they'd accept that. Um, so I sent that in and I, I just wanted to make a few comments about um, when you go through this process, obviously you've got the peer review process, which is, is good. They send back feedback and, and uh, you make some changes and, and so forth. But this one had another process. It had a committee as well. So you've got peer review and then the committee. And this was the interesting thing. So um, eventually I'm like, what's happened to this? And I, I wrote to the guy I was li liaising with and I said, what's happened, is, is, what's happened to my article? And they said, oh, I, I, I don't know, but I just found out it's up online. I'm like, oh, okay. So I went in and I read it and I just read the first part. And I'm like, why am I reading this? I wrote this. <laughs> it's there. Okay, good. Anyway, uh, recently I did, a pres I, I did a presentation to this study group and I, I sent out um, my article for them beforehand. And uh, one of them wrote back and said, what's this in your article? And he, he quoted a line and I, I looked at it and my, almost, my heart almost stopped beating. And I'm like, did I write that? There's no way I'd write that. I can't, I can't believe it. And I was in shock. And um, it was just this one terrible line. And so I, I quickly got out what I had sent and then I compared it. And it wasn't my line. <laughs> so it's just a... Uh, Word to the wise, um, peer review is fine, but when, the, when there's a committee involved, committee has power to do things. And um, I then went through and I checked, you know, everything. And I, I, I noticed quite a lot of changes and some of them were good. Rearranged some stuff and, and then they cut out some stuff and I'm like, nah. and it was interesting to try and figure out why they cut it out. But then they added this whole chunk in one paragraph. And um, the committee or a rogue member of the committee obviously thought they were enhancing my articles. And uh, it was it was terrible, this one particular line. So I actually wrote and I said, look, this is up under my name. I'm fine with most of the changes you made, but there's no way I can have this sentence in my article. Can you please take that? And here's why. And I, they they changed it straight away and quite a few of the people were also shocked so i'm not sure who put it in and how it got there but this is just the 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 difficulty of working with committees as pal as opposed to just uh peer review um some of the other changes they took out some things which were a little controversial but i can understand that they this is representative um yeah so it was good to get it out there i, I enjoyed doing it um but yeah just standard different um, processes involved and uh, be prepared for that. So that's what I had, Peter. I'm sure Rich has got something different for us. It's a good intro. <laughs> yeah, uh, now technology. Do I just put my dongle in and it should all fire up? <laughs> I need help. I feel a hundred today. I've got a really bad back. <laughs> your back? <laughs> I'd rather have borrow your back, actually. Oh, yeah, cool. 
I can't remember the password. Yeah, I can't help you with the password. No, no. <laughs> Don't worry, I've been watching all those IT videos and I wouldn't give it to you anyway. All right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, now, you lovely ladies here, you're not going to see much, and it's, it's probably going to be so boring, but um, I don't know whether you feel like making a bit of a move that way, but you probably won't. Can you see Jenna from there? Yeah. Sort of skew. Um, yeah, so I'm Richard Morris. For those of you who actually haven't met me, well, I guess most of you have, but there's a few new faces around. Uh, I lecture in visual arts. I also um, <clears throat> work with Robin Pierce in the TAS space in education, and we, we do a bit of design technology, welding, uh, timber work, and that sort of thing with our secondary students. Uh, my background is carpentry. So before I took an interest in, in teaching, um, that's what I did for a job, and I still love working with timber. Um, but I've put this slide up here just to sort of what I want to do this morning, uh, today, this afternoon, is just spend a little bit of time just talking about my planning practice, which I call my research. So it's a it's a practice based research, and I write about it, but primarily I actually make things. I'm a maker, um, and that ranges from prints to photographs to small videos, sculptures, and paintings. And today I just wanted to focus just a little bit on my painting practice. Um, but I've put this slide up here because it actually kind of gives an introduction into what my practice is all about. <clears throat> and from a, a relatively early age, I took a strong interest in, in, in my faith, with, uh, getting to know Christ. And the relationship that I developed with him was often uh, something that took place when I was actually in the landscape. And there's this kind of dialogue that's gone all through my life of actually spending time in nature and, and spending time with God. And so when it comes to uh, making art, uh, I found that that naturally kind of, it almost became a kind of an impetus to development for the development of a kind of a visual language where you're sort of developing your own uh, iconography uh, as a Christian and as a painter. And so that's sort of, you know, how I would explain it. Um, and as you become more versed with other people's practice, um, it sort of impacts yours and, and it grows and, and morphs over time. So these are some sort of key painters uh, that have had quite a strong influence on my own work. Um, Colin McCann, a New Zealand painter who, who dealt with a lot of biblical subject matter in some very big black and white paintings. A lot of artists, particularly painters, will move to black and white um, as a way of sorting out their subject matter. So it sort of gets rid of all the nuances and all the attractions of colour and beauty, and it tends to focus more on content. And I think that, you know, I was really impressed with the way that, that he did that in his own work, uh, often really just dealing with strong Bible texts and turning the words, the letter forms themselves into actually iconic forms and shapes. That's actually down in the National Gallery. It moves position. I think it's in one of the stairwells at the moment, but it's about a six metre long painting. It's actually a mural. It's very powerful. Fred Williams, um, <clears throat> iconic Australian painter of the landscape. I just love his colour. I love his kind of very modernist feel with the way he approaches landscape subject matter. I've thrown a slide in here that comes all the way from Venice. It's a Byzantine um, mosaic. Uh, I just love the way that you know they built pictures a long time ago, bit by bit, in little fragment pieces. And, of course, Rosalie Gascoigne, uh, an elderly woman now deceased, uh, who did these fabulous big murals. This one's Monaro, which is really a kind of um, an ev evoc evocative sort of, I suppose, um, piece of work that deals with that Monaro highway sort of between Canberra. And so looking at the way that the wind blows over the hills and all that moves the grass and that sort of thing. So in the development of my own painting practice, you know, I kind of being a carpenter, being interested in colour, being aware of other people's art, uh, wanting to also, you know, um, I suppose, look at the dialogue between abstraction and figuration. In other words, between things that are unrecognisable and things that are. I was probably more drawn towards abstraction and I still am. 
Um, and so what I started to do was in my early days, I was um, sort of dividing my time up between teaching and, and painting. And I found that, you know, I'd have to teach in an hour and I got an hour here that I could do some work. And I couldn't really always afford to get covered in paint. So what I ended up doing was pre-painting all these panels of, of uh, board, letting them dry, teaching, you know, and then when I get a period of time, it might be a small period of time, I could actually saw these pieces of uh, painted uh, board up. And then if I got another bit of time somewhere else down the track, uh, I could actually assemble them. And that's what I found really exciting. I actually found the process of assembling these kind of um, pictorial surfaces, these kind of abstract images, really satisfying. And I still find it really satisfying. That's what I love to do. It sort of makes a lot of sense to me. And it's kind of like my own sort of uh, iconography in a way because I develop those images, I make those images, I decide what they look like, where they go, what they, you know, what they do and, and whether they're a failure in my own, you know, opinion or not. And that sort of thing. So this particular work's only small, it's probably only half that size, but it's an early sort of example of the works that I was doing. There's some leather forms in here, which are all letter set that have been put over the top because I went to Oxlade's art supplies one day and they were having a major sale of it all. They were virtually giving it all away. And I think I've always struggled to find a voice through abstract painting. It's very hard. It's, it's probably got to be one of the most inefficient ways to communicate ideas. <laughs> but, I, but I, I can't not do it. It's just, you know, you, you're sort of born a certain way. This piece of work here um, is a lot, much larger. It's probably about six feet tall. Um, and this work here was looking a lot more at the kind of the rhythms uh, very abrupt rhythms um, of textures and colours. And you can see there's some pretty strong influences McCann in terms of, you know, this iconography that he uses. Um, but again, it's highly abstract. And, you know, when you make a painting or any piece of art and you put it out into a community, a gallery or out with the public, you can have all the ideas you want as, as the artist, but everybody will work out what it means to them. Sorry. And they might think it's rubbish. And you get a thick skin after a while because um, as my mum told me, she said, Rich, don't worry, I'll tell you if it's crap or not. <laughs> my dear mum. Um, in the early, well, actually about 2000, year 2000, I started uh, working on a PhD. I was graciously given the old coffin making shop over here, which is now gone, um, been buried. Um, and I had the, um, I suppose, the opportunity to work at a very large scale. So that was really, really exciting. And um, I started at a master's level and then I wanted to upgrade to a PhD. And uh, they said, well, look, we need, my, my supervisor said, well, let's come out and have a look at your work and see how you're going. And I showed them the work I was doing and they said, well, look, we, we really think that you're actually, your paintings are actually already up to PhD standard but you need to find something to write about. And so I thought, yeah, okay, well, that's interesting. So that's when I started trying to articulate, you know, a lot of what I was interested in, which is very hard when it comes to abstraction because a lot of it's very felt. It's actually a, a very personal experience. But what I decided was that the way I was making my paintings had a lot of affiliations with montage and cinema. And so, you know, with cinema, you have this idea of these frames, these clips, and these small pieces of film, which become montaged together to create larger meanings. And so in a way, I was doing the same thing. All of these, uh, well, not all, you can't see all of these, but this painting itself is actually made up of a lot of vertical strips. It's sort of a little bit obscure in this picture because it's a picture from my paper. It's the only slide I've got left. Um, and what I would do, as I mentioned before, I'd pre-paint and then I'd start assembling. And as I'm assembling, I'm creating these sort of trajectories and these shapes and these areas and this composition. And sometimes there's quite strong rupture, you know, where there's a collision and there's kind of like a jump, an aesthetics. And other times there's a lot more passage and a lot more continuity. And that kind of, those tensions, the relationship between that kind of you know, that, that sort of the synergy of parts and the abrupt tension between parts was something that I've almost developed as a sort of a metaphor. And I sort of felt that that in a way was 
kind of thing I was chasing when I make art. It's this kind of engagement with the surface that that has a sense of animation, but yet it's still, but it, it keeps me engaged as a viewer because, you know, when you make paintings or when I make paintings, I don't make paintings for other people. I make them for myself. Now, I don't have many of them. They've gone out to other people's places. But the thing is, that's primarily my motivation. Um, and, you know, you you make things that you want to look at. So they're the things that I want to look at. <laughs> this is another piece. This one's called Written in Sand. Uh, it's a lot more subtle. It's got a lot more to do with surface. It's some uh, very gentle passages of, of delineation in it. There's a few little bits of, you know, recognisable kind of letter forms and things like that. Um, and again, my paintings really uh, tend to be a kind of a, a, a sort of a synthesis, if you like, of my beliefs, the things I'm reading, the things I look at, the experiences I've had in the landscape. And they kind of all come together and, and my background and the things that I like to do with my hands, you know, and I like to make things, I like to cut things, I like to assemble things. And I, and I just, you know, I've been doing it for a long, long time and God willing, I'll continue to do it. This is a big piece uh, called Paperback Landscape. Um, this was bought by Newcastle Uni. I think it's still in the Ukmudi Library up there. I'm not sure. It's rather big. And uh, when I completed my PhD, by the way, Daniel here was um, one of my supervisors. And uh, I can highly recommend him, even though he's starting to kind of bow out of the whole process. Fabulous supervisor. Really enjoyed having him on board with, with this project. Uh, this is another piece, Swing. So a lot of them, you know, they're very kind of um, devoid of colour. And again, I think part of the reason for that is my kind of insatiable desire to try and work out my content as an abstract painter, is to get the content that I feel has some merit, but it's not really a didactic content, is it? So that's the difficulty um, as a painter is that, you know, you're creating these... Uh, images that really have no meaning to anybody other than what they're prepared to imaginatively project onto them. But for me, you know, I love the idea of fragment parts. It's something that I hold, sort of hold dearly. I love the notion of a fragment. I see it as something that we all really have in, in and of ourselves as, as people. I think we're all in some ways quite fragmented. And as Christians, you know, when we, we kind of have a relationship with God, he, he does something in our life where he's pulling us together within ourselves and amongst each other and in our world. And I see that kind of tension between that fragmentation and that kind of like, you know, configuration, if you like, as being a really lovely poetic uh, and a strong metaphor. So this one I call Bay. I live out Mirabuka. We look at the water. It's never that colour, but that's called artistic licence. <laughs> Scar tree was you're looking at the whole idea of grattage, of erasure. Um, I'm very interested in surfaces. I'm interested in 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 distressed surfaces. Um, I'm interested in in mark making, uh, but I'm also very interested in erasure because I feel that when you start to erase things that are there, you get some really lovely subtle histories emerging in the surface of the work. This one's called One Tree Hill. Um, I was a, a finalist in the Gosford Art Prize a couple of years back. Um, it's probably one of the closest images, I think, to being almost um, um, figurative in the sense that, you know, you can see a tree, you can sort of see this sort of landscape hill. And funny enough, that one was inspired by uh, a, a hill not far out here at Martinsville as a student. It was actually a memory I had. One day I was going through a really difficult time uh, here at Avondale as a student. Travelling home, I remember seeing after a fire, this hill blackened. And then about three, four weeks later, there was a single tree that got this new sprout of green leaves. And I, and I saw it as kind of like, I don't know, it was a metaphor of hope and of rebuilding and of a future, a bright future. So that that sort of is how that one came about. And that's dog, my dog, Honey. And this is what I do with my students. So that's just a, 
This is the last slide. So this is what we do down the punning drawing class. We find subjects, they can be people, they can be landscapes, things like that. And we just make art based on them. So how you interpret them, we just look at shapes, colors, textures, and things like that. And I love my teaching here. And I've been doing it for a long time and it's the greatest job I've ever had. But look, that's just a little intro into what I do with my painting practice. And um, it's a nice light way to end up on this whole thing, hopefully, Peter. <laughs> yeah. All of that, and he's an expert on pebble pad as well. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks to you <laughs> and our many phone calls. <laughs> yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks, thanks, Rich. Well, I was going to open up to questions, but uh, our time's almost gone. But if the presenters would like to hang around, and you can go and ask them uh, individually afterwards, um, if you've got something you want to ask, um, just to thank you to everybody who's come. This is very gratifying uh, to see the roll up uh, for, for for today and a particularly a particular thank you to the uh, professional and support staff I think you know it means a lot that you're interested in the work that uh, the academic side of things is doing so thank you for coming and uh, special mention to Graham here too if you don't know Graham is our long-term has been our long-term editor of Teach Journal so thanks for showing your interest Graham and coming along too. And um, and thanks to Kirsty again uh, for for setting up and organising, and our IT team who's who's come in and, and helped as well. Thank you to the presenters in particular. Um, I didn't give you a detailed brief because I wanted it to be um, whatever you came up with, uh, and that's what we had. And there was a lot of variety in in the presentation, so we thank you for that. Yeah, well, um, just like a church lunch, it's always the fruit that's left over. So if you want to grab some of that on the way out, then uh, be my guest. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>